In this video, I'm going to continue our, our uh, representations of Maxwell's equations. So we started off with the vector form of Maxwell's equations. We restricted that to linear isotropic media, where we have relationship with, linear relationship between our D and E fields and our B and H fields. And we found the geometric algebra form of Maxwell's equation, singular. We went from there to the geometric algebra form uh, in a manifestly relativistic basis, the space-time algebra, which uses the Dirac uh, basis as the, uses Dirac vectors as the basis. We found a very compact form of Maxwell's equation, also singular, uh, grad f equals j, where grad is a space-time derivative and j is a uh, four-vector uh, current and charge density and f is a bivector. We're gonna go from that to the tensor representation in this video. And the tensor representation is essentially the expansion of Maxwell's equations in its, Maxwell's equation in its uh, space-time algebra form in coordinates. And if we expand this in coordinates, we'll get the tensor representation. There's a little bit more to say about the STA form before we go straight into the tensor uh, representation. And let's go and do that. In a nutshell, the tensor representation is we get to take Maxwell's equation, grad f equals j, and we split this by writing grad f as grad dot f plus grad wedge f equals j. We look at the components here. Here, we have a grade two, we have grade one, grade one, grade two, and grade one. So this dot product is a vector. This wedge product is a tri-vector, whereas the uh, current density, charging current density, is a vector. So re this really means we have two equations here. We have one vector equation grad dot f is j, and we have one tri-vector equation, grad wedge f equals zero. Now, these will directly map to the tensor uh, representation. But having split apart our equation, which we worked so hard to get Maxwell's equation, we worked hard to get Maxwell's equation into one piece, but now we've split it. And there's actually something really useful that can be said having split this. In particular, Let's look at the second equation. This equation says that grad wedge something equals zero. Now, here's, this is our chance to introduce a four vector. Because if we say that that something has a very specific form, which is also a curl. And here I've used curl as the uh, grad wedge this is automatically equal to zero, regardless of the, for all a. So this 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 shows that the structure of f is a curl. A four. So the specific, and, and so let me expand this out in coordinates. So grad is. gamma mu d mu, and we're wedging that with a mu gamma. I will write that in the indexes down for the RAs. The, oops, uh, mu prime. Okay, can I use the same uh, index for both terms because we have repeated indices and and our, we need one uh, up and one down for each index. So if we, we expand this out, we ha now have gamma mu, I'm gonna write nu as mu prime, nu d mu a mu. So by, by uh, asserting that, that our uh, 
third A bivector is a curl, we have the, a following coordinate uh, representation. We can go a little bit better. And in tensor algebra, we're almost at tensor algebra here, that one of the standard tricks is to take, uh, represent something as half of twice as something. So we're going to do that. So this is half of gamma mu gamma nu. And we're going to add that to itself. And when we add that to itself, we're going to just swap indices. They're dummy indices. We can do that. So we now have d mu a mu. But this wedge product is minus gamma nu wedge gamma nu. And we can group our terms. We now have a gamma mu uh, wedged with gamma nu and a gamma nu wedged with gamma nu. So we have half of gamma nu wedged with gamma nu d mu a nu minus d mu a mu. So this is f. Now, if you have seen the tensor representation, you would know that this quantity here that we've just found by asserting that f, we asserted that f was a curl of a four vector. This is the quantity that is known in tensor algebra as f mu nu. So we say f mu nu is one half of Oh, not one half. Just, we have the one half in here. Our one half avoids double counting over all the repeated mu nu's. And so, but f mu nu by itself is just the next anti-symmetric set of partials. So there's f mu nu in tensor form. So. By having 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 asserted that f is a curl, which we which we were able to do because grad wedge f is zero, then we find a coordinate representation of f as follows. So let's let's actually go and expand grad wedge f uh, explicitly to justify like it so one justification is just formally so if we have a vector and we wedge that vector with something with itself wedge with something else this is going to be zero because we can do this so if we had a wedged with a wedge b that is going to be the same as a wedged with a wedge with b, but a wedge with a is zero, so this is zero. So you could just say, let, let a equals grad. And that would show that, that grad wedged with grad wedged any vector for vector a is zero. But it's useful to expand this out and just to justify that this is still the case when the vector is something as abstract as the space-time gradient. So if this is a space-time gradient, then we have, I'll write one grad as d mu, gamma mu d mu, I'll write another grad as gamma mu d mu, and I will write a as gamma sigma, a sigma something. So this now is d mu wedge with d mu wedge with, but gamma mu wedge with gamma nu wedge with gamma sigma all times d mu d nu a sigma. And we can use the same trick of adding half of 
twice. And it should be clear that, that this is going to give us d mu, or gamma mu, which with gamma nu, which with gamma sigma, all times d mu, d mu, a sigma minus d mu, d mu, a sigma. And so by equality of mixed partials, we have zero. So that, that justifies saying, this justifies grad wedged, grad wedged, A equals zero for all A, provided A is well behaved enough that we have equality of mixed partials. So if that was, if you had a less pleasant A, then you would not be able to say this. So we're going to insist that A is well behaved enough that we have equality of mixed partials. So that is an implicit constraint. Now, having uh, so we have we have some tensor relationships here. This is essentially tensor logic, but we we the what gave us the ability to do this was the anti-symmetry of the wedge product. Now, there's a few other things that are interesting before we move on completely to the rest of tensor algebra. And that is, so we have here that, let's say, grad f equals j. And now we have said, we're going to let f equals grad wedge a. Now, what if grad dot a, the four divergence of a, is zero? So if, if the four divergence of a is zero, then f is actually just grad a. And we have now grad squared a equals j. Or this might be written as box a equals j in, in because what this grad squared is d mu d mu which is d zero d zero minus d one d one minus d two d two minus d three d three. This is just the wave equation. It's a wave equation operator, sometimes written as box. We now have wave equation of A equals J. And if that's the case, then we have here a scalar operator, a four vector and a four vector. And we just go and solve this with the Green's function for the wave equation. And if we do that, so you can think of this as four different equations, and because we've imposed a constraint on A, we really have five equations. So we have we have grad A mu is J mu for all mu equals zero, one, two, three, four. And we also have grad dot A equals zero, which is D mu A mu equals zero. So given these five equations, five equations, four unknowns, we should be able to solve this. And the specific way that we solve this is doing what is called a gauge transformation. So let's suppose that we can solve del squared A tilde equals J. And here we don't care. So here we'll say that grad dot A tilde is something, something not equal to zero. So if we can solve this, then let's say now a equals a tilde minus grad of something. This is a gauge transformation. And if we insert this here, then we have, so we, we say that step one, we solved. 
They found some A tilde for which the wave equation of A equals J, where J is a forcing term. So uh, in a mathematical sense, that's all it is. And like we can write that specific, that equation out specifically. So A tilde is G of XX prime, J of X prime, GX prime, where G, G is the Green's function for grad squared. So that, that's the solution. I, I can take that as a given. And now, now let's look at what is grad dot A. So grad dot A is grad dot A tilde. And A tilde is a known minus del squared chi. And we can insist that this now is zero, provided grad dot A tilde equals del squared chi. That's a, also a, so we now have chi is g of x, x prime, grad dot a tilde, all evaluated at x prime. And this is not dx prime, but d4 x prime, the four vector volume element, scalar volume element for for the our Green's function. Now we have a way, we have a full solution for Maxwell's equations in terms of potentials. And that solution is so chi and a tilde Bam, there is a solution to Maxwell's equation where A is A tilde minus grad chi and F is the curl of A. And So uh, actually, what's kind of interesting here is the freedom, this freedom to introduce a, a four vector gradient of some scalar function chi, it actually doesn't actually impact F at all. So formally, this gives us a way of, of finding a solution for A that has a zero divergence. But once we plug that into F, so we have f as grad wedged a tilde minus grad chi, which is grad wedged. Oops. Grad wedged a tilde minus grad wedged grad chi, which is zero. So our gauge transformation here adding in grad chi into the mix specifically so that we satisfy the, the uh, zero divergence requirement uh, doesn't actually matter in the end when we compute the, the Faraday uh, bivector field because that gradient term is just killed. So we don't even have to go and find that, but should we want to find an A that has a zero divergence, our, our Lorentz gauge condition zero divergence of A, then we can do that using this procedure. Anyways, this I think was worth mentioning before we go to the to the full tensor relationship because should have really mentioned it during the STA uh, form because it gives us a way of solving the STA equation. We actually want to solve the STA equation using the Green's function for the gradient, the four vector gradient as opposed to the uh, four vector uh, Laplacian, but uh, this is a good, this is an easy first step because, because this scalar Green's function is very well known. And of course we have to 
uh, considered boundary value conditions and other things, but but that's that's a different game. So I've covered the four vector representation of the field, gauge transformations and gauge freedom. And now I want to move on. And we also looked at, at uh, we also saw that in, if we do use a four vector, a four potential representation of our field, then our two equations, uh, grad dot f equals j and grad wedge f equals zero. This one is really redundant. Because this is automatically true anytime we have grad wedge, grad wedge, something. So by virtue of having, having chosen f as the curl of a, we are now reduced to a single equation. But it is worth noting for completeness that if we expand out grad wedge f equals zero in coordinates, we get one of the standard tensor relationships. So let's do that now. So the task is expand grad wedge f coordinates. Specifically, we're going to expand graduate wedge f equals zero in coordinates. But we, let's start with grad wedge f. So we know what f is in coordinates. That's one half of gamma mu, which is gamma mu, f mu mu. And grad, which put with that, is d let's say beta partial beta wedged with oops it's not a wedge <laughs> wedged with one half of d mu wedge with d mu f that is one half of gamma beta, which with gamma nu, which with gamma nu, partial beta f mu nu. So there's grad wedge f. It's a trivector equation, so this is equal to zero. But we can't just say that that uh, partial beta of f mu nu is zero because part of this relies on the anti-symmetry of these wedge products. So how can we say something just about the coordinates themselves that, that will clearly have to involve some sort of anti-symmetry? And the way we can do that is we can wedge one more time. So we get a, a four vector pseudoscalar term and this wedge with, let's wedge gamma alpha with grad wedge f. So if we do that, now we have half of gamma alpha, wedge with gamma beta, wedge with gamma mu, wedge with gamma nu of d beta f mu nu. This will still all equal zero. And, but if we look at it specifically, this is always going to be plus or minus the pseudoscalar for, so we have i is gamma zero, which with gamma one, which with gamma two, which with gamma three, or just the products of those since they're all perpendicular. And this, so we can rewrite this in a similar way as gamma zero, which is gamma times gamma one times gamma two times gamma three, provided that is a 
scale by plus or minus So here, for example, if alpha, beta, mu, nu equals 0, 1, 2, 3, then we get the 0, 1, 2, 3 out of it. And if we have any, any permutation of, 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 uh, of these in our original term, then that will be reflected by this completely anti-symmetric uh, tensor here, the uh, levi symbetica tensor. And now this, equals zero. Now we have a scalar multiplied by a the pseudoscalar, and we can just say that this scalar portion now has to equal zero. This gives us one of our tensor equations. So we now say epsilon alpha beta mu nu d beta f mu nu equals zero. Here's one of our tensor equations. And should you go and plug in f mu nu, if you write f mu nu is d mu a mu minus d mu a mu, you plug that into here, you'll see that it's automatically equal to zero, regardless of anything else. This is a statement of zero equals zero, but the, this is zero equals zero with this specific representation. So this, this is a different way of, if you, if you formulate Maxwell, one of the, the portions of Maxwell's equations in this form, it does imply that you have to have an anti-symmetric uh, representation for F mu nu. And you could go and, and uh, show that as an exercise. So our next step is, and this would be the second last thing to do. Now we want to expand we want to expand grad dotted with f equals j in coordinates. So to do that, what we have to do is we have just have to dot both sides with one of the basis vectors. So we'll say gamma mu dotted with grad dot f equals j mu. So we we have to do some work to figure out what what this specific dot product is. This is a four vector. Here is a four vector. We end up with a scalar. That scalar is going to be j mu because j mu is j dotted with gamma mu. So let's let's compute that. We'll start off with just computing the the divergence term. So grad dot f is, and we'll say again gamma beta d beta dotted with half of new gamma new f and I'm going to want actually indices downstairs here for this one because I have here upstairs index and downstairs indices and if I dot these together I'm going to get something nice if I had did not, if I use the upstairs index representation, then I'm going to end up with g mu and mu is in the mix and it's going to be uglier and it would just be more work. You could get this, you would get the same result. But let's not do that. So we only have half of gamma beta dotted with gamma mu, which is gamma mu, all times d beta f mu. Here. And one of our standard geometric algebra, uh, if we take a dot product of a wedge product that is a dot b times c 
minus a dot c times b. This is the we do the inside and the outside terms, and when we do the outside term, we flip the sign. So doing that here, we have gamma upstairs beta dot of gamma downstairs mu times gamma nu minus gamma beta dot of gamma nu gamma mu. Let me just focus on rewriting this term for now, not worrying about the rest of it. We're just rewriting that. Now we have delta beta. Oops. Delta beta mu times gamma nu minus delta beta nu gamma nu. And we can expand this. So expanding out, let's replace our dummy beta index with mu and nu. So we get d mu gamma nu minus gamma nu d mu f mu. And so here we have we have one of each indices. These are dummy indices. We can replace those dummy indices. We'll all do an index swap of those indices. So this we can say is gamma nu d mu f mu mu, but mu mu is minus f mu mu. Now we have we have an f mu nu, we have an f mu nu, we have a d mu and a d mu and a gamma mu and a gamma nu. Everything matches nicely. The minus sign will be killed by that minus sign, and so this wipes out the half. This is now just gamma nu, d mu, f mu, mu. So this, we have now just computed grad dot f. And since I was interested in dotting this with gamma mu, and I have mu used here, we'll do another index change. And we'll say that this is, let's say gamma beta, D alpha F alpha beta. So gamma mu dotted with grad dot F is gamma mu dotted with gamma, gamma B beta all times D alpha F alpha beta. And that is just delta mu beta times the same. So we swaps, swap our betas with mu's, and we're left with oops, d alpha f alpha mu equals j mu. Bam. In our Maxwell's equations, we've now figured out the tensor form for Maxwell's equations, which were alpha and beta, mu nu, d beta, f mu, a zero. There's the tensor form of Maxwell's equations. The last, li last little thing we want to do for completeness sake is uh, relate f mu nu's or alpha 
we want to relate our, our Fs back to the electromagnetic field. So if we're interested in Es and Bs after all of this, remember that we had in it, the expansion of F was EK gamma K gamma zero minus C times gamma one gamma two B three plus gamma and all the all the uh, even permutations of one, two, three indices here. So we have two, three, eta one plus gamma three, one, eta two. So what is the correspondence between this and our tensor components, our coordinate expansion, which was Write this as gamma mu which gamma mu so that I have I'm picking indices downstairs to match indices downstairs. And so right away we can we can identify that EK for any k equals one, two, three equals F K zero. And then we have minus C B three equals F one two minus C B one so F two three and minus C B Two is F three one. We should be able to write this in a little bit tidier fashion. And let's see, that would be minus C B. Let's use R S T as indices. We have R equals now f12 is going to be the same as f12 and this will be the same as 23 and this will be the same as 31 because we'll get a sign change for each index that we drop downstairs so two sign changes doesn't change the sign whereas fk0 is going to be minus fk0 for our magnetic field components, well, because we have two spatial indices, that will be that won't be the case. So we can rewrite this as epsilon r s t f s t. There we go. So let's put the minus on the other side. We want to summarize our interrelationships between the the electrochromatic field components just in terms of tensors alone without resorting to SDA. We have now we now have that EK is FK zero, and we have C B R well epsilon R S T F. TS. There we go. So that's the last the last step is just we wanted to ensure that we have a way of relating our tensor equations back to the original electric and mag magnetic field components without having to go back and look to see uh, how we we represented the Faraday field in terms of those tensor components. And so that is, let's say the, the, the last, if we were summarizing, we also have that D alpha, F alpha, 
beta is j beta, and we have, I think I used different indices before, I, well, I know I did, uh, d beta f equals zero. There is a complete representation in tensors. 